Good morning and welcome as we are gathered by the Holy Spirit for the work of bringing our praise and our prayer before the God who dwells among us. Some good news to share. Um, our small team handed out almost 1,000 meals this week. I seem to have lost my specific notes and I apologize for that, but it was very close to 1,000 meals with each recipient getting enough food for three meals a day for three meals. So thank you for your generosity and thank you to Foodlink with whom we partner. Don't forget today, if you have specific prayer requests, to type those into the Q&A box as we worship, and those will be read during the prayers of intercession. And also in my email this week, I sent out uh, three questions from the Bishop's office. If you would please be so kind as to return those to me, your answers, um, we'll get those to the Bishop's staff and, um, and that will help in forming some um, plans and policy moving forward. But for now, we take a breath. And we light a candle. as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship. We are gathered in the name in which we are baptized, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea, you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. And at the river, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word, you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Are being laid bare. May we 
build a nation that's loving and fair. God, give us the courage to change what we can, to work for the justice that's part of your plan. So turn us around, Lord, to make your world new. May we seek in all things to first follow you. In change and in sorrow, may we seek your reign. O oh God, in our pausing, restore us again. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O Christ, you have indeed been raised from the dead. Therefore, let us live as though death no longer holds us hostage putting our hope in the one who goes before us, both in death and in eternal life, our Savior, Christ. Amen. So I brought something to show you. I found this. I found this in a closet. It's a box full of old letters. Yeah, they look like they look like this. You know, it's an envelope, and inside of the envelope is paper, and it's all it's all handwritten. This whole box were letters that my parents and my brother and my sister wrote to me when I was in college, because they lived far away. They lived in a whole other country, and back then, believe it or not. We didn't have cell phones and we didn't have email. And so all of our communication was two weeks apart as we wrote letters back and forth. And they're really kind of fun. They're really kind of fun. Here's a letter from my little sister. She was still in elementary school. She talks about how annoying my brother is, our brother is. And then she goes on to tell me how wonderful I am. And she does this because at the end she says, and can you please send me candy? My sister, who's a real health junkie right now, she wanted candy. And uh, this is a letter from my brother, and um, you spelled my name wrong. And uh, this is another letter from my brother, and he spelled my name wrong again. And uh, this is another letter from my brother, and he spelled our last name wrong. That's kind of funny, because we had the same last name back then. And those are letters that are full of details of his school life. Actually, they tell me a lot about how little he liked school back then and, uh, and said some stuff about, you know, our parents, but I can't say anything because they might be watching. But anyhow, these are pretty cool letters. And, and this was one from my mom, my mom. Um, and, and when I read that letter, uh, she, she kind of was telling me I didn't write often enough. I had stopped writing so often and she wasn't very happy about that, but but, you know, then she went on to tell me how proud she was of the grades I was getting. And um, so these are kind of interesting. And, and I'm telling you about these because, um, because, well, they tell a story. See, I'd stopped writing so much to my parents because I had a boyfriend. And so I, I wasn't spending so much time letter writing. And, and my mom was giving me some good advice about dealing with friends. And I remembered I was having some trouble with some friends at college. And, so they kind of tell a story. If you think about what maybe the other side of the letter said, what I had written to them, the responses. I'm telling you this because this Bible, in this Bible, you might think it's one big book, but it's not. From here to here, this part is all letters. It's all letters. Most of them written by the Apostle Paul to communities. And when we read them, we get a glimpse of the life that these people had, and we get some really good advice. 
But you know, these letters from my parents, the one thing they told me every single time was that they loved me. It was very consistent. These letters, every single time. Paul tells the people of God in some pretty cool places like Thessalonica and Galatia and Corinth. Aren't those fun to say? Anyhow, he tells them that God loves them. He tells them, like my mom, how much he misses them, how much he wishes he was with them. He gives them good advice about being with people. He talks about the details of their lives and he tells them every single time that God loves them. So remember today, God loves you. It was written down a whole bunch of times, and that's why we worship, to remind each other, Jesus loves us, we love each other, because we have God's love in us, just like those people. Let's pray. Hey God, thank you. Thank you for Paul's letters and the reminder that we are loved. Thank you for the ways we tell each other, maybe not so much in letters anymore, maybe in emails or texts or before we go to bed with our parents telling us each night how much we're loved and valued. Thank you, God, for coming to us in all those loving ways. And all God's children said, amen. Way back in April, one of Sybil's first devotions was from Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, which is, we walk by faith and not by sight. When I read that, which was a fabulous devotion, I kept thinking of this song. Once it got in my head, I couldn't get it out. So Wanda and I thought we would like to share it with you this morning. Faith we see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design, in the lives of those who prove his faithfulness. Walk by faith and not by sight. By faith our fathers roamed the earth with the power of his promise in their hearts. Of a by God's own hand, a place where peace and justice reign. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward, till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. By faith the prophets saw a day When the longed for Messiah would appear With the power to break the chains of sin and death And rise triumphant from the grave By faith the church was called to go In the power of the Spirit to the lost To deliver Every corner of the earth. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward. Till the race is finished and the work is done, we'll walk by faith and not by sight. By faith, the mountain shall be moved. And the power of the gospel shall prevail. For we know in Christ all things are possible. For all who call upon his name. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward. Till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. We will stand as children of the promise. We will 
fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward. Till the race is finished and the work is done, we'll walk by faith and not by sight. Loving God, help us so to hear your holy word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe, and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The first reading from Mark chapter 12. Some Sadducees, who say there was no resurrection, came to him and asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no child, the man shall marry the widow and raise the children for his brother. There were seven brothers, and the first married, and when he died, left no children. And the second married, and the widow and died, leaving no children. And the third likewise, none of the seven left children. Last of all, the woman herself died. In the resurrection, whose wife will she be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, is not this the reason you are wrong, that you know neither the scripture nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the story about the bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is, is God, not of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Reading from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you. Well, unless you've come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn have received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive though uh, some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. But whether it is I or they, we proclaim to you and so have come to believe. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? 
if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain. And your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testify of God that he raised Christ. Whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. But the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. That those who have died in Christ have perished. For if this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. <laughs> but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishability. And this mortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. I'm not generally a fan preaching on the letters of Paul. Of course, we've been doing it. This is the third week now. Because the letters are sometimes an expression of encouragement, and at other times they're just a laundry list of instructions. And sometimes they give Paul a chance to go on and on and on, expounding about his own credentials. And other times, ouch, they're just scathing reprimands. They just don't preach very well, not like a story. I like stories, you know, the stories of Jesus and his disciples, Abraham and Sarah, the disciples trying to figure out things after Jesus' ascension, those well, they're much more interesting to me, and I kind of think probably to you as well. But just like these letters from my family do more than just list what was happening in their lives so many years ago, or what they were doing, or where they had been, or expectations of my college behavior, they tell a story. They tell a story of a family in a specific period of their lives, they tell a story about a family in transition. Children were growing up and there was deep and abiding love for each other. There's a sense of adventure that, that I grasp when I read those. There's a lot of richness in those letters. And so too is there a rich narrative underlying Paul's letters. For they are written by an evangelist passionate about his calling and eager to share the good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. So Paul was an itinerant preacher traveling from town to town, earning his living somehow, but infiltrating community after community. Enter the town and go and find a place where people were worshiping, be it a, a synagogue or, or even a group just gathered by a stream and he would join them and worship and pray. And as he engaged with the people that he found there, he would tell them about 
Jesus about his life, but mostly about his death and his, re and his resurrection and what that means for the community life together. Paul was good at it. People would come to believe and then word would spread and churches were formed. And long before the gospels were ever written down, he was writing letters to the churches. Ah, when the church was doing great, he encouraged them to keep following Jesus. When the church was argumentative and fragmented and a hot mess like the church at Corinth, well, he reminded them of the unifying power of faith in Jesus Christ. And boy, this church was a hot mess. These people couldn't agree on anything. They couldn't agree on what they should eat or how they should eat. Resulted in lines being drawn in the sand and a divided community with one part here and one part here. There were rival groups. They were advocating some of them that, hey, Jesus can forgive anything so we can do anything. And therefore, Jesus will keep forgiving us. But then there were those who were pledging their allegiance to individual pastors and evangelists, the ones who had baptized them. And there were political alliances being formed and people lashing out at each other when they didn't agree. And finally, there were those in the community that claimed to have special powers and spiritual gifts and mine is better than yours. No, mine is better than yours. And it just went on and on. Paul reprimanded them. Oh, he did. When Paul was done reprimanding, when Paul concluded his chastising of the community, when Paul finished checking off for them the lists of do's and don'ts, Paul told them that precious story yet again. And no matter what, that story is consistent and the story is strong and the story drew them back together. Remember, he says, remember that Jesus Christ died for you, was crucified and buried. His body was placed in a tomb and three days later, just like he said, he rose from the dead. And he appeared to Peter and the disciples, and oh, it was so magnificent. And finally, though I didn't deserve it, Jesus appeared to me. It was unworthy, yet Christ called me to be an apostle. And I've been called to share this story with you because it's your story. This Jesus is the one in whom we place all our faith and all our hope. It is a story that remembers us as believers. And friends, this story remembers us. That's what the story does. To remember something is to bring it together. Each of us separate and yet united under the cross of Christ. The story the body of Christ itself is not complete until we are one. To remember something is to bring the members together. Just like the early church, the churches of Corinth and Galatia and Rome and Asia, there are in our world and even in our church differences of opinion. In my lifetime, I've seen so many changes in the church, so many conflicts. There was, um, well, the ordination of women was one, and, and I remember huge fights over the age of First Communion, and then just a few years ago, in, in recent history, the fight over inclusion of the LBGTQ community, and then, of course, frequency of, commun of communion, and, and whether or not we should have common communion with the Episcopalians and the Methodists and the Presbyterians, and the list goes on and on. And I've heard so many arguments given with such passion. And I've worshipped in churches with all the smells and the bells, and I've worshipped by lakesides in my shorts and sandals, and I've heard 
arguments about the merits of high church and low church. And now we're hearing arguments about whether or not we should open our church buildings or keep them closed. <sighs> our age old friend sin it just creeps in constantly, fanning the flames of controversy with tried and true practices of greed and envy and malice and self-righteousness. And here he is again, egging us on. And I'm just really thankful not to have to share a list of do's and don'ts or argue to keep us on track, but rather that I have a story that guides us that makes us whole and complete. Because no matter where our heads are at any given moment, no matter what winds of change may be blowing around and through us, oh friends, this story is consistent and true. That Jesus, born of Mary in a stable, lived and he died for you. He was buried in an empty tomb and they pushed a cold, hard stone in front of it. He was in there for three whole days, three long days before the women arrived to anoint him. But when they arrived, the stone was moved and the tomb was empty and they were greeted by an angel who told them, hey, he's not here, go, go and tell his disciples to meet them in Galilee. You'll see him there for he cannot be confined by death. And indeed, Jesus met the disciples many times, as a matter of fact. He showed them his hands and his side. And there was no doubt that it was the risen Lord, and he broke bread with them, and he shared the peace with them, and he offered them the comfort of his presence and the coming comfort of the Holy Spirit. And after instructing them in all things and commanding them to remember him, in their words to each other, he ascended into heaven. But that's not the end. For Jesus can't be confined by earth or heaven or a cold, dark tomb. And we who have faith are called and commanded to remember him to each other to call one another into fellowship with the risen and living and active Christ. This is our mandate. This is our call. For when we share the story, Christ comes to us yet again. And when we share and remember the story, we are made whole. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, tolls, and sweat snares, I have already come. Tis grace has 
has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The Lord has promised good to me, His word my hope secure. Let us confess our common Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him, all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is set us at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. It seems too good to be true, but you have conquered death, O Lord, and removed its sting. May this truth give us hope, courage, and freedom to live bold lives as your disciples. God of life, hear our prayer. As one thing dies, another is born. The cycle of death and rebirth is imprinted into your creation. Teach us to let go of what we want to pass on so that we might embrace what is waiting to emerge. God of life, hear our prayer. As another academic year draws to a close and we pause to acknowledge the successes and disappointments of the past year, we give you thanks for all the opportunities you give us to grow. May we take what is good and bring it forward into your future and learn from past mistakes. God of life, hear our prayer. Our sufferings in this life is but the blink of an eye 
compared with the eternal peace which awaits us. When trial overshadows us, give us perspective and hope for the wholeness perfected in you. Today we offer prayers, especially for God of life, hear our prayer. Gracious God, give skill and resilience to all who are caring for the COVID-19 sick. In your wisdom to those searching for a cure, strengthen them with your spirit, that through their work, many will be restored to health. God of life, hear our prayer. Hear now the deepest desire of our hearts. Bless our leaders and leaders all around the world with wisdom and compassion. For Charlie, who is having knee surgery on Tuesday, God of life, hear our prayer. Risen Lord, you give us hope that in all things, and we entrust our prayers to your grace, knowing that you have heard us. In Jesus' name, amen. We now use this time to reflect on the blessings that God has given us and to offer ourselves to God in some way this week as we care for our neighbors, ourselves, and our world. You are also welcome to use this time to offer a prayer over your offerings. <clears throat> We are bold to pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the one who brought forth Jesus from the dead raise you to new life, fill you with hope, and turn your mourning into dancing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you, now and forever. Amen. Don't forget, after the postlude is finished, to join us for coffee hour. And now may the peace of Christ be with you always. Please share a sign of Christ's peace with one another in the chat window.